Hey guys and welcome back to day two of Mystery Week and today we're actually travelling across the channel to France where I'm covering my first ever French case. Although my research shows that this is one of the most iconic unsolved cases in French history, I'm ashamed to say that I'd never actually heard of it before doing this video. It's known in the French media by many different names, Le Petit Gregory, Le Fair Gregory, or I'm just going to refer to it as the Gregory Villemon case. And believe me, this case is one hell of a journey. A lot of people compare it to the John Bonnet Ramsey case, or a lot of people also refer to the Circleville letter case when talking about this one. I covered the Circleville letters just a few weeks back. And as I always say with foreign cases, I'm just going to apologise now for my horrific butchering of the French language, my French accent and pronunciation definitely leaves a lot to be desired. So I'm definitely gonna like make a lot of these words sound very, very English, I'm sure. So the Villemans are a family from a very small village in France called Le Ponge sur Villone. And it was a very quiet place where not much really happened, a place where everyone knew everyone. There were just a few small shops, just a very sleepy, quiet place. And like I said, nothing ever really happened there until a few months before Gregory Villemon disappeared. The Villemon family, mostly Jean-Marie, who was Gregory's father, and his wife Christine, as well as Jean-Marie's parents and siblings, start to receive some letters. And these letters were quite threatening. They were all completely anonymous and most of them threatened vengeance against Jean-Marie. You see, Jean-Marie wasn't that much of a well-liked man. He wasn't horrible, he wasn't a criminal or a villain in any way, but he was just one of these people who'd rub people up the wrong way. It seems he was known to be a bit of a show-off and he liked to brag about how much better he was doing than everyone else. He liked to brag about his wealth and show off. He'd actually recently been promoted to a supervisor in the car parts factory where he worked. I think he'd been promoted a couple of years earlier and he liked to brag about how much money he made in that position. He was in charge of about 20 men and they referred to him as chief or the boss. And he bought one of the nicest houses in the village and he filled his house with really nice furniture like oak and leather furniture in a place where most people couldn't afford luxuries like that. And he made some enemies along the way. So someone had a big problem with John marie because of this. So they'd start to send these letters and soon these letters turn into phone calls as well. And the phone calls were always very crackly. You can never really tell who was on the other end. You couldn't even tell if it was male or female. So whoever it was was going to a lot of lengths to hide their voice. But the Villemon family didn't really think too much of it. Obviously it was annoying getting these threatening letters and these threatening phone calls, but they just changed their phone number and that was it really. They just pretty much brushed it all off. But something that John marie would later comment on is how it seemed like whoever was writing these letters knew personal details about their lives. It was almost as if their house was bugged. Somebody was listening from within the walls. And John marie would say that was probably the only thing that really, really concerned him about the letters, that they knew personal details that not many people knew. But for the most part, they were just brushed off until the 16th of October, 1984. So Christine was at home with her and Jean maries only child, four-year-old Gregory as she was just in the house doing some housework just like faffing around and she'd put Gregory out in the front garden to play and this was something she did quite often like I said it was a small village she wasn't too worried about Gregory going off anywhere he was quite a shy and timid child and he would just always happily play in the front garden and she never really thought much of it um, until this day when she realises that Gregory has disappeared. She realises shortly after 5pm that she can't see him anymore so she runs outside to look for him and she is just completely panicking and she can't find her son anywhere and she even runs over to the babysitter's house and she asks the babysitter if she has Gregory and of course the answer was no. So whilst Christine is panicking running around the place trying to find her son, Gregory's uncle, Jean-Marie's brother, Michael Villemon, receives a phone call. I just want to say that I'm aware that it might be Michelle Villemon. Some sources wrote it as like the English spelling, so Michael, and some wrote it as the French spelling, which is Michelle, because I'm English, I'm just going to go with the English pronunciation here. Um, but Michael receives a phone call, and he receives it from the same anonymous caller that has been plaguing the family for months. The caller says, I have taken the boy of the chief. I have thrown him into the Valone, which was a nearby river. And Michael said that the call was so muffled that again, he couldn't tell if it was a male or female. I'm not sure if Jean-Marie and Michael knew about Gregory go missing before this call, but I know that after the call, they immediately head out and they start searching on foot. And they start by searching the woods behind the house. Even though they've already got this call saying like the boy is in the river, 
they don't take it overly seriously they thought maybe it was just another threat and so they carry on searching the woods as in maybe Gregory has wandered off maybe you're just in denial maybe you don't want to think that somebody has taken your child um but they're searching the woods Obviously the police are contacted and the police are looking for Gregory as well and the police do head to the river to look for Gregory and sadly about quarter past nine that night they find Gregory's body. He's found in the Vallone River just as the caller said and he had his feet and hands hogtied behind his back with cord. He had his blue raincoat on still, the raincoat he was playing out front of his house in and his woolen hat was pulled down over his eyes. And as you can probably guess, this is the kind of case that the media attached onto immediately. This became a huge, huge media sensation. And it's also worth saying that this case was handled really badly from the get-go. That's a really important bit of context. Like, pretty much everyone in this case messed up at some point. From everything I could read, it seems like the medical examiner, the one who looked at Gregory's body after he was dead, just assumed that he died from drowning. So it didn't actually overly check that this is the case. The medical examiner didn't check his heart, his lungs or his intestines and it was just badly done. A rumour began to spread which said that the water in Gregory's lungs actually wasn't river water and that it was bath water. Obviously you can tell the difference by like the bacteria and stuff in the water. Um, and I'm going to say that this is just a rumour because it also said obviously that the medical examiner didn't bother to check the water in his lungs. Um, so this rumour did start to spread so there's a lot of like maybe misinformation about this case saying that Gregory died in the bathtub and was later placed in the river but as far as I could tell there was actually nothing to fully back this up but of course I may be wrong as I always say with cases that are like foreign obviously there is a language barrier there and I can't be 100% sure on that so if you do know if you are French and you can find that piece of information out it'd be really helpful to put that down below. A few days after the murder the local gendarme who are basically the acting police in this village um, the gendarmes are basically soldiers I think from what I gather who were sent to these sort of like villages and places to act as the police so they are the police but they're not police they're soldiers but they're the police if that makes sense so the gendarmes were the ones in charge of like investigating this case and a few days after Gregory was found dead they actually found something very interesting near the riverbed they found an empty vial of insulin and a hypodermic syringe now of course this could be nothing or it could be something very important the use of insulin in this case would easily have rendered Gregory unconscious almost immediately and insulin also wouldn't show up in an autopsy they wouldn't be able to test Gregory and find out if he'd had insulin injected into him obviously if he had been rendered unconscious pretty much immediately then the whole murder would have been a lot easier but the medical examiner never actually examined Gregory's body for any bruises or for needle marks. So even if this is the case, then they never even bothered to check for it anyway. The medical examiner never noted any needle marks, but never even looked for them. I do wonder if they ever really followed this insulin lead up because obviously not everyone in this village would have access to insulin. I wonder if there was anyone who was diabetic or had some sort of medical need for insulin that they never really looked at. The day after Gregory was found, the Villamans actually receive another anonymous letter and this one reads, I hope you die of grief boss, your money can't give you back your son, here is my revenge you stupid bastard. This anonymous letter writer later came to be known in the media as Le Corbeau or The Crow in English. So now whenever I refer to this letter writer, I'm going to call them The Crow. And this is a reference to an old German movie, I think. And like I said, Jean-Marie remarked how The Crow seemed to know everything about them. The Crow just seemed to know all these details, which not many people knew, but they could never really pin it on anybody. Obviously, after the body was found, a legal procedure was pretty much immediately put into motion and a judge was appointed to lead the inquiry into Gregory's death. And this judge was 33-year-old Jean-Michel Lambert. Now, Jean-Michel was a really young judge. Like I said, he was 33 years old and he hadn't had much experience in doing what he was doing. Obviously, he was good enough to become a judge, but this case was huge. This was one of the biggest cases in French history. And so to have such a young green judge in charge of this was possibly or definitely a mistake from the very beginning. Judge Lambert got given the name by the media Le Petit Judge, which obviously was a reference to how Gregory was Le Petit Gregory. And Judge Lambert actually went out and spoke to the press on like his first day on the job and said to them, this is a simple affair. He said how he soon expected it to be solved and 
that was it. And he would soon go on to regret this because obviously to this day, it's never been solved. Judge Lambert was inexperienced and it really showed in such a high profile case. He would hold daily press conferences where he'd go in front of the media and pretty much tell the media everything he knew, everything the police knew. And obviously in these kinds of investigations, you can't just tell the media everything. You've got to hold some things back, things that are important to the investigation. But Lambert was just sharing everything. And it got to the point where the public knew every single thing the police knew because Judge Lambert was just going out in front of the media and telling them everything. And it seems that he just really liked the attention from this. He would appear on TV and radio constantly and it just came across that he fancied himself as a bit of a celebrity. He wasn't so bothered about finding out what happened to Gregory as getting all this media attention on himself. But all this media attention did was made it very, very obvious that the police actually had no leads to hit. They had absolutely nothing. And it didn't help that alongside this very inexperienced judge, nobody was doing their job right. The medical examiner I've already spoken about just didn't do his job properly. And even the police were doing stupid things like not labeling evidence properly, not filing it away, not storing it properly. And just everything was just done badly. Even small things like the audio of the Crow's phone calls weren't stored properly, weren't looked after properly. So obviously after the whole investigation into Gregory, the police tapped the Villamon's phones to try and record these calls from the crow. And by the time the police actually came to like play these back in court, they'd been so badly handled, played so many times that the audio just didn't work. But that's not to say the police didn't find a suspect, they did. They found their prime suspect in 29 year old Bernard Laroche, who was actually Jean-Marie's cousin. And although they were cousins, they weren't really. So biologically they were cousins, but Bernard had actually lost both his parents when he was younger. And so Jean-Marie's parents had raised him alongside Jean-Marie. So they were cousins slash brothers. At the time of Gregory's death, Bernard was married. He actually lived a couple of villages over and he had a wife called Marie Ange. And him and Marie Ange had a son together who was only 10 days younger than Gregory. But their son Sebastian was quite disabled. He had a lot of medical problems and he required around the clock care. Although Jean-Marie and Bernard were family, they had a bit of a strange relationship. It's known that they didn't always get on the best. And at one point, Bernard actually tried to get a job at the factory with Jean-Marie and Jean-Marie refused to help him out. And that's maybe the perfect example of the kind of thing that Jean-Marie would do that would rub people up the wrong way, understandably so. Everyone was convinced, including the Villamons, that the answer laid within the family. There was somebody within the family, somebody who knew them personally, who had done this. A handwriting expert was called in from Paris to compare the writing of the Crow to the handwriting of different members of the Villamon family. And this person actually concluded that there was a strong probability that Bernard was the one who was writing these letters. And she also noted that these letters had imprints on them. So you know when you have a notepad and you're writing on the top page and you flip the page over and the page underneath then has the imprints of what you were writing before. Well, this handwriting expert noted that these letters were covered in these imprints. And so a different expert was called in to try and decipher what these imprints said because the answer probably laid in these words. And this expert was supposedly able to find an imprint of a signature on the bottom of one of these letters and the initials on that signature would be L, Bernard Laroche. Another expert also concluded that the voice on the phone calls matched that of Bernard. Bernard and his wife Marie-Ange were questioned but then they were released without charge. But Marie-Ange was also very, very suspicious. She definitely acted strange as well. After the murder, she actually goes into the village and calls the police from a phone box in the village and makes this anonymous call where she says that she suspects this elderly couple in the village. And she basically spends all this time trying to pin the crime on this random elderly couple. This couple were proven to have nothing to do with the crimes, but why was Marie-Ange so determined to pin it on them? And why did she feel the need to go into a phone box in the village and make this call? Why couldn't she just do it from home? She also showed a huge interest in the inquiry, so much so that the police started to notice how much of a weirdly big interest she was showing in it. And it wasn't so much from the point of view of like, oh, my nephew's disappeared and I'm worried about him. It was just nosiness more than sort of grief. And like I said in my video yesterday on the Soa murders, this is something the police always look out for in an investigation. People who get too close to the centre of it. And also another thing about Marie-Ange is that she didn't show up for work on the day of Gregory's murder or the day after, although it was noted as well that she generally did take a lot of days off. She was very sickly. 
But then a very interesting witness comes forward in the form of Marie Ange's 15 year old sister, Muriel Boll. Muriel told the gendarme that that day Bernard had picked her up from school and they're then driven to the Villemans house where Bernard picks up Gregory and they all drive to a nearby river, the Valone. All of them included Bernard, Muriel, Gregory and Bernard's son, Sebastian. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Sebastian required around the clock care and Muriel said that Bernard had taken her to look after Sebastian whilst he got Gregory. Now, like I mentioned before, Gregory was a very shy and timid child. And this also led to the theory that Gregory had been taken by somebody the family knew quite well because Christine was insistent that Gregory wouldn't have gone off with a random person without making a noise, without making a fuss. And Christine said she was only just inside the house. She was keeping an eye out the window for him. And so she likely would have seen if there was some kind of scuffle or a lot of noise. And she just didn't hear anything. And so Christine thought that Gregory had been taken by somebody he knew, somebody he was willing to go with. On the back of Muriel's story, Bernard is arrested and Judge Lambert announces to the press that the case has been officially solved. But then out of the blue, Muriel goes back on a statement saying that the gendarme forced it out of her. And something you've got to know about Muriel is that she was a very unremarkable girl. She was low intelligence, not particularly special looking in any way. And she was very much aware of this. And so she craved attention and she'd get it from wherever she could. And so the judge decides to completely dismiss her entire statement. But it's actually worth saying that Muriel said instead of Bernard picking her up, she'd got the bus home from school that day. But when she was asked to describe the bus driver, she described her regular bus driver, a guy with a beard and dark hair. And it just so happened that day, the regular bus driver wasn't on that route. It was a different driver, a guy who was clean shaven and wearing glasses, something that you would probably notice. And Muriel didn't notice this. And the bus driver also insisted that Muriel was not on his bus route that afternoon. But then the case heads in a completely different direction. Three separate people come forward and say that on the afternoon of Gregory's death, they'd actually seen Christine, Gregory's mother, driving into the village towards a post office just before 5 p.m. And this was a post office from which the crow was known to send all of their letters. And Christine said like, yeah, I did go to the post office, but I went the week before, the Monday before, I didn't go to the post office on the day that Gregory died. But regardless of whether this was true or not, this was enough to shine a light on Christine. So new handwriting letters were called in to have another look at the Crow's letter. And this time, strangely enough, they found an 80% match to Christine. And so the judge advises her that she's suspect. And so takes her in for an interrogation where she's interrogated for nine whole hours. By this point, we're obviously a few months into the investigation and Christine was actually in the early stages of pregnancy. She had fallen pregnant again and she actually collapsed under the stress of the interrogation and was taken to the hospital where she'd spend the next couple of weeks. And the judge who, completely against the advice of the district attorney, releases Bernard on bail. He doesn't drop the case against Bernard, but releases him in the midst of all of this media attention. People were so, so angry and he decides to just release Bernard back onto the streets. And the media attention on this was just unlike anything people had seen before. The journalists were like leeches, aching to get any tiny piece of information. And so one journalist manages to get hold of Muriel's taped confession, which hasn't actually been released to the public by this point. Nobody knows why Bernard was arrested. They just know that Bernard was arrested. But this journalist finds out it's on the back of these tapes from Muriel, and so takes them and actually plays these tapes to Jean-Marie. And of course, Jean-Marie at this point is in a very bad state. He's lost his son, his wife is the number one suspect, and his wife's also pregnant and has collapsed and is now in hospital getting care for their unborn child. His cousin slash brother is also a huge suspect in this case. And all of the media attention is just, it's just a lot. And so Jean-Marie hears these tapes from Muriel saying that Bernard has basically killed Gregory. And Jean-Marie is, obviously furious about this and the journalist has to calm him down and be like no don't do anything stupid but obviously Jean-Marie does eventually do something stupid. One day Jean-Marie grabs his hunting rifle and heads out into the street as Bernard is leaving work and he confronts Bernard in the street and shoots him in the chest with his rifle killing him and apparently Bernard's last words were I didn't kill your kitty. Jean-Marie, of course, then gets arrested because now he's a murderer. So now Christine's in hospital with this unborn child that she's trying to make sure is safe. And she's a suspect. Bernard is dead. And now Jean-Marie is in prison for murder. 
But Christine never once cracks under the pressure, even to this day, she's never ever cracked under any of it. And this is even when the police come forward and say that they've actually matched tyre marks found near the scene of Gregory's death to Christine's car. But Christine had actually sold this car three months earlier and by the time the police have managed to track it down, the new owners have driven it over a thousand miles, meaning that they can no longer compare the tread on the tyres to the marks found on the ground. So when this was not sufficient evidence, the police decided to do a search of the Vinmon house. I think another search, I'm pretty sure they'd already done one previous to this. And in this search, they find the same cord that had been used to tie Gregory's hands and feet behind his back, which obviously immediately looks hugely, hugely damning. But what you've got to remember is this was a very small village with a very limited amount of shops and probably a very limited amount of places that you can buy rope or cord. And so I can imagine that pretty much anybody in this village who owned rope would own this same rope. But this was enough for Judge Lambert and Christine is arrested. And Judge Lambert struggled to pin a motive on Christine, struggled to say exactly why Christine would want to kill her child. And the only thing he could come up with was a fit of madness. And even when psychiatrists like analyzed Christine and found that she was fine, there's no way she had a fit of madness and killed her son. The judge still stood by this. Personally, I really struggle to see any reason as to why Christine would kill her son here. Maybe I've missed something in all the translations, but it seems like a lot of people in France really think that Christine is guilty. And I couldn't really pinpoint why so many people think this, why so many people think that she killed her own son. I struggled to see a motive and I struggled to see really any evidence whatsoever that would suggest that she had done it. So again, if you are French and you do know some more like nuances of this case and you know why so many people hate Christine, then again, I would really like to know. To me, it just seems like the police had to find another suspect now Bernard was dead. They had all this media attention on them and the judge and the police were just like, right, we need someone new. We need more press coverage on this case. And so they turned their eye to Christine. But the district attorney soon intervenes and finds there to be insufficient evidence to hold Christine in custody. And so she's released, even though the charges still stand, she's just released from custody. Um, she's released after 11 days and actually years later, she was awarded a very large compensation for unlawful arrest. In mid-October 1985, so almost exactly one year after Gregory's death, Christine gives birth to her second son, Julian. In December 1986, she then appears in front of the county court where she's charged with murder. And her attorney actually puts in a request for the charges to be dropped. And so the case is elevated to the appeals court to take a fresh look at this case with a fresh set of eyes and realise that just everything has been done very, very badly. They recognise all of the different errors. They can't really pinpoint why Christine has been arrested, why she's a suspect in this case. And so they swiftly remove Judge Lambert from the case, finally. A different judge takes over, Judge Maurice Simon, and he's considerably older, he has a lot more experience. And Judge Simon decides to start this case from the very beginning. It is the only option that he has to him. He just cannot continue the case with what he has. And so he starts from the very beginning, all evidence is like relabeled. He just does everything as it should have done from the start. This time there's no filing mistakes, there's no storage mistakes. Everything is exactly as it should be. And he actually completely stops the press interviews. He refuses to speak to the press any longer. He allows all of the media attention to slowly die out and along with this, the pressure disappears. So they now have no pressure on this case and just take their time and figure out what really happened. On Christmas Eve 1987, Judge Simon actually orders the release of Jean-Marie because he's still in prison for murdering Bernard and he orders the release of him pending trial. And the trial actually takes place years later in November 1993 where he pleads guilty to murder. And Jean-Marie is sentenced to only five years because obviously it was emotionally motivated. Um, but because he'd already served a few years before this, he just had a few weeks left to do and then he was free. Jean-Marie and Christine solely thank Judge Simon for the fact that they didn't get longer sentences. And they say that just everyone lost sight of what they were actually trying to do with this investigation. They were trying to find who killed Gregory and just turned into this huge media sensation. Everyone wanted to know all the latest gossip and it just seemed like the police and Judge Lambert were just trying to pin on whoever they could 
so they looked good to the press. Nobody actually really cared about finding what happened to Gregory until Judge Simon joined the case. Um, years later, Christine was officially cleared of all charges. That was on February 3rd, 2003. So after nearly 20 years, she was officially told like, yeah, we don't think you had anything to do with the murder of your son. Um, the investigation closes and it officially becomes cold. However, also that year in 2003, new technology meant they could potentially test the DNA on the back of the stamps on the Crow's letters. And this was huge. They'd never had the technology to be able to do this before. However, it turned out that the sample wasn't stored correctly. It was too old and the DNA was just too degraded to be able to do anything from it. So it was just another dead end. In December, 2008, the case actually reopened after the Villemans begged for years for somebody to take a fresh look at the case. And they hoped that this time they could do more testing. Obviously, technology is getting better by the year and they thought more testing would yield better results here. They wanted the cord and the rope to be tested, and it was, and again, nothing came from it. Um, more testing was also done in 2013, and this was also inconclusive. But then in 2017, there was a huge break in the case. Progress in handwriting analysis meant that they were able to identify the writer, apparently, finally, of the Crow's letters, and they identified the writer as Jacqueline Jacob. Now bear in mind they've already identified the writer as both Bernard and Christine, I would take this with a pinch of salt. Um, so Jacqueline Jacob would have been Jean-Marie's aunt, so Jean-Marie's dad's brother's wife. Both Jacqueline and her husband, Marcel Villemon, were both arrested alongside one of Gregory's aunts, Jean-Marie's half-sister. Now this aunt was quickly released, but Jacqueline and Marcel were not. These arrests followed analysis of almost 2,000 letters and linguistic analysis of the phone calls, which basically led them to conclude that it was both a male and a female doing this. It was more than one person. More than 100 different witnesses were interviewed and 12,000 pieces of evidence were input into this database. And this database basically was able to analyse all of these statements, all of these pieces of evidence and find any inconsistency. So find when people are lying, find when times don't quite match up. And apparently all of the evidence pointed to Jacqueline and Marcel. The couple have obviously strongly denied the allegations, but honestly this happened in 2017 and there haven't been many updates in the case since then. From everything I can find out, it seems like Marcel and Jacqueline are very much still suspects and the police are definitely still looking into them, but I couldn't find any articles about it past maybe the beginning of 2018. So it's been almost a year and there have been no more updates. I'm sure the police are building a strong case against them, but I'd be very intrigued to see whether this actually leads somewhere or if it's just another dead end. And now we just wait and see. It's been almost 35 years since Gregory's death and it would be incredible if it could be solved this late in the game. I mean, with new technology and new things that are happening all the time, it's very much a possibility. Thank you so much for watching this guys, make sure you click the thumbs up button down below and subscribe to my channel and leave your comments down below, especially if you're French, if you know more about this case, if you've sort of grown up knowing about it, I'm really really intrigued to hear all of your guys thoughts here.